Hi, everybody. You know, one of the things I like about reading is being able to draw parallels between real life and fiction. And today I want to talk about the parallels between the lives of Phyllis Hyman and the fictional character of Suge Avery from Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Real life or fiction can mirror real life in so many different ways, and I think this is a pretty good example. So first, let's talk about Suge Avery. Now, she was uh, an entertainer, and she was uh, well-liked, she was loved, she had uh, a fan base, and she traveled the country. And in her personal life, she was loved by Celie, and she was loved by Albert, which you know, might be a bit debatable. But anyway, so those were her, you know, the uh, instances of her personal life. So, uh, and then we have Phyllis Hyman, an extraordinary performer, uh, just this majestic stage presence loved by people all over the world. You know, just, just an amazing entertainer. And inter interestingly, um, Phyllis was asked to read for the role of Suge Avery in Steven Spielberg's uh, The Color Purple film adaptation back in 1985. And she's sitting around the table with Whoopi Goldberg and Danny Glover and Oprah. And uh, unfortunately, the only one, the only actor who walked away from that table reading and didn't get the role was Phyllis. And uh, in her biography, Jason A. Michael talks about some of the reasons for that uh, with some insight from Phyllis's psychologist. So uh, it's unfortunate because I would have really loved to have seen her in that role because as I think about her, the more I learn about her and, uh, you know, think about the character Suge Avery, I do see some parallels. So anyway, um, so, you know, that role ended up going to another actress. But Phyllis did have a pretty amazing career. Uh, you know, there were some challenges, but um, in spite of all that, I mean, still in 1985, she uh, did Broadway, where she was in Duke Ellington's Sophisticated Ladies, and she actually received a Tony nomination for her performance in that. And also, during that time, she forged a really... Uh, close relationship with uh, some members of the Ellington family. So now we're going to, I'm going to talk just a little bit about a personal anecdote from Phyllis's life. And this is from the biography uh, written by Jason A. Michael. Well, uh, in chapter 18, there is this uh, really complicated moment in Phyllis's romantic life. She had just ended a not so serious relationship with an actor that she was seeing. And uh, she had begun to rekindle a relationship with uh, a former girlfriend. So she was performing in Chicago and she was really excited to get back to New York to spend some time with her girlfriend. But unbeknownst to her, her staff who wanted to surprise her, uh, and they were very well-meaning from the way I read it, uh, they weren't aware of her recent breakup with the actor. So uh, when she got back to New York, they thought it would be a good idea to surprise her and fly him in to see her. And they did, and he came. And uh, of course, this kind of disrupted the plan she had to spend time with, uh, with her girlfriend. And this, you know, unexpected event really uh, upset both of them. So, uh, so this real life scenario to me, it kind of echoes a passage from The Color Purple where Suge Avery comes home for Christmas. So listen to this passage that I think is pretty evocative and then I'll come back and we'll talk about it a little bit. Dear God, Suge writes she got a big surprise and she intend to bring it home for Christmas. What is it, us wonder? Mister, think it a car for him. Suge making big money now, dressing furs all the time, silk and satin too, and hats made out of gold. Christmas morning, us hear this motor outside the door. Us look out. Hot diggity dog! say mister, throwing on his pants. He rushed to the door. I stand in front of the glass, trying to make something out of my hair. It too short to be long, too long to be short, too nappy to be kinky, too kinky to be nappy. No set color to it either. I give up. 
tie it in a head rag. I hear Suge cry, oh, Albert, he say, Suge, I know they hugging. Then I don't hear nothing. I run out the door, Suge, I say, and put out my arms. But before I know anything, a skinny, big tooth man wearing red suspenders is all up in my face. For I can wonder whose dog he is, he hugging me. Miss Seely, he say. Oh, Miss Seely, I heard so much about you. Feel like we old friends. Shook standing back with a big grin. This Grady, she say, this my husband. The minute she say it, I know I don't like Grady. I don't like his shape. I don't like his teeth. I don't like his clothes. Seem like to me he smell. I've been driving all night, she say. Nowhere to stop, you know, but here us is. She come over to Grady and put her arms out to him. He look up at him like he cute and he lean down and give her a kiss. I glance round at mister. He looked like the end of the world. I know I don't look no better. And this my wedding present to us, say Shug. The car big and dark blue and say Packard on the front. Brand new, she say. She look at mister, take his arm, give it a little squeeze. While we here, Albert, she say, I want you to learn how to drive. She laugh. Grady drive like a fool, she say. I thought the police was going to catch us for sure. Finally, Shug really seemed to notice me. She come over and hug me a long time. Us two married ladies now, she say. Two married ladies and hungry, she say. What us got to eat? Dear God, Mr. Drink all through Christmas, him and Grady, me and Suge cook, talk, clean the house, talk, fix up the tree, talk, wake up in the morning, talk. She's singing all over the country these days. Everybody know her name. She know everybody too. No Sophie Tucker, no Duke Ellington, no folks I ain't never heard of. And money? She makes so much money, she don't know what to do with it. She got a fine house in Memphis, another car. She got 100 pretty dresses, a room full of shoes. She buy Grady anything he think he want. Where you find him at? I asked. Up under my car, she say. The one at home, I drove it after the oil gave out, killed the engine. He, the man, fixed it. Us took one look at one another. That was it. Mr. Feelings hurt, I say. I don't mention mine. Oh, she say. That old stuff finally over with. You and Albert just like family now. Anyhow, once you told me he beat you and won't work, I felt different about him. If you was my wife, she say, I'd cover you up with kisses instead of licks and work hard for you too. So thank you guys for listening to that. I appreciate it. You know, I just really find it interesting when uh, I see instances of when uh, real life and fictional stories kind of intertwine. So I just wanted to share that today. But did you notice during Seeley's letter how she is really, really impressed with the people that uh, Shook Avery knows? She's kind of fangirling and she's just so impressed with all these people that Shook Avery knows. And she mentions Duke Ellington. And here, this is 1985 when this book is published, but a full four years prior to that, Phyllis Hyman is on Broadway doing the Duke Ellington Review, Sophisticated Ladies, getting to know Duke Ellington's family. So I just really, really um, thought that was interesting and wanted to share today. So if you found this insightful at all or um, entertaining in the least bit, um, I ask you to please uh, subscribe to the channel, like and comment and all those things. And uh, I hope to continue to bring you more um, instances of how real life and literature intersect. Thanks for watching. Until next time.